There's hardly anyone here that will remember what we talked about the last time we were together. And uh, it all started with the question that came in right at the very beginning. And that is about Matthew 24 and all of those signs that are, that are there in Matthew 24 and the fulfillment of that. So we use that as a sort of a, a beginning place. The next week we came back. Uh, the week after that we, uh, we, uh, all, we, we almost finished it. And then the, uh, the last time we were here we looked at verse, uh, verse 29 through 31 that says immediately after the tribulation. Here are the things that are going to happen. And uh, so uh, I think we need to be aware of the, uh, uh, the context of the things that are there. I, there. There's no way to go back and restudy all that we have looked at. But I want you, I, here's where we begin this morning, is Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, the question is asked by the apostles, Tell us when these things will be. What things? When one stone will not be left upon another. And what will be the sign when these things are about to happen? That's the question. Now, you read Mark's account. You read Luke's account. It's only in Matthew that you have that expression, what will be the sign of the end of the world? And I think that is really significant. For those who receive the account and only had Luke's writing of it, and those who received uh, Mar- uh, pardon me, Mark's account and his writing of it, if this passage discusses the end of our world, And that's the way we use this, right? You believe the end of the world is is here. The signs are right. The end of the world must be about here. But those who got Mark's account and those who got Luke's account would never, ever have been able to understand it. You've got to think about that. If this passage is 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 a discussion about the second coming of Jesus and the signs that will precede the second coming of Jesus, then if you only had Mark's account as the Bible was being written, or if you only had Luke's account or a copy of Luke's writing, there is no way on earth you would have ever have gotten to the, uh, the end of the world. Now, here's something real interesting. You look at Matthew chapter 24, and, and whenever, whenever you look at the, at the, uh, the, the text, the question in verse 3, the expression, end of the world, is only found in the King James Version of the Bible. Isn't that significant? Isn't that amazing? If you, you got a new King James, I mean, all that is is, is a revision to reflect the, uh, the Greek more accurately. When you get to that expression, the end of the world, the last phrase of Matthew chapter 24, it's not the end of the world. What's the expression there? It's the end of the age. And I find, I find it really remarkable whenever uh, uh, I've studied with Jehovah's Witnesses. And of course, they believe the world ended in 1914. You may not be aware of that. But Jesus returned in 1914. At least they thought he was going to come back, and he didn't. And then they thought he was coming back in 1975. Is that about, what, 50 or 60 years from 1914, 1925? And uh, guess what? It's about time for them to set the date for time number six. That whole religion has been based upon Stirring people up to the fact that Jesus is about ready to come. Jim Roger, I, I see you perked up right there. Listen, you've had more studies with the Jehovah's Witness than about anybody I know, and I thank God for what you've done. Jim's taught me a lot about some of their doctrines that, uh, that, I, that I did not understand. And, uh, but uh, it's about time for them to set the date again. But when I study Matthew 24 with them, I said, why don't you read that out of your translation of the Bible? And you get the, the translation of their Bible, it doesn't say the end of the world. 
It says the, cons the consummation of the age, the consuming of the age. What is the context of these signs? Not one stone of this temple will be left upon another. The time is coming when this temple that was there by the decree of God, that that not one stone of that temple was going to be left upon another, and they said, that's the end of the age. It's the end of Judaism. You don't have the temple. If you don't have the altar, if you don't have the priesthood, if you don't have that altar where animal sacrifices can be made, if you don't have the holy place and the most, place, most holy place where, all, where so many of the rituals of Judaism were found, it's the end of it. And that is the question they were asked. What will be the sign of thy coming? And so Jesus gives some signs, wars and rumors of wars, but he says, verse 6, these are, verse 8, these are the beginning of the sorrow, the, 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 the uh, beginning of sorrow. Wars and rumors of wars, that's the, that's the beginning of it. There's more to come after these early signs. And then he tells us exactly when the end of the world is going to come. You've got to get this. When you get down to verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end will come. Jesus said, I'll tell you exactly when the end is going to come. The end is going to come when the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. It will be preached as a witness, and when that happens, the end will come. The end of the world, not as we use that expression, not as you and I use that expression, but the end will come, Jesus says, it will come when the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. He's answering the question. Give us the signs of the end of the world. Here's the beginning of it these wars and rumors of wars, and the end of it is when the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. Uh, that's not hard to understand. You just had a Bible. You didn't have the televangelist. You didn't have religious friends who were, using, who were mis redefining the expression the end of the world. If you sat down and just read your Bible, and that's the way people were who got Matthew, Mark, and Luke got these three accounts. That's all they had. And so when they said, what will be the sign of the end? Tell us when it's going to happen. And he says, here is when it's going to happen, when the gospel has been preached to every creature. That's what he said. This good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And when the gospel has been preached to all the world, then the end will come. Now the question is, has the gospel ever been preached to every creature under heaven? And uh, you know, you know, there's a divine record of this. Look in the book of Colossians. Keep your finger in Matthew 24. We'll be back here in just a minute. But look over in in um, in the book of Colossians. Um, in the book of Colossians, he says in chapter one. And verse 6, he says, he, he, he says that this, that we mentioned the gospel in verse 5, and in verse 6, he says, which has come to you as it has also in all the world. Present tense. When Paul writes this letter, he says, not only has the gospel been preached in Colossae, the gospel has been, or the gospel has been preached in all the world. Can you make it any plainer than that? 
Look in verse 23. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23 says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. He says, if you do this, God's going to bless you. You need to continue in the faith. You need to be grounded in the gospel and do not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now look at the tense, which was preached to every creature under heaven. Has the gospel ever been preached to every creature under heaven? Well, there's no, quite, no doubt at all about that. Two verses, and there's, a, there's a, uh, the last verse of Romans chapter 10 says, says the same thing, going out to the ends of the earth. The gospel has been preached to every creature. How do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit twice in this one book says, the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. Now then, go back to chapter Matthew chapter 24. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? When is all of this going to happen? Well, the beginning of it is wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be a, a, a lot of wars that are happening. And then he says, but the end marker, the last sign that must be fulfilled, is the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. Has that happened? The Holy Spirit says it has. Then, whatever end Jesus is talking about has already happened. And so to go to Matthew, 23, Matthew 24 and talk about, oh, the signs are right, all of this inflation and the price of gasoline and all the corruption there is in the world, and all the wars and rumors, of war. and what about all these tsunamis and earthquakes and hurricanes? Why, well, there's never been anything like it. Is that a sign? He says these things are going to, he does mention, does he not, after saying these are the beginning of sorrows in verse 8, verse 9 he says, then there will, they will deliver you up to, to um tribulation and, and you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake many will be offended false prophets will arise and lawlessness will abound has there ever been a time in the history of america when there's been greater lawlessness how'd you how would you like to be a first re responder in this day and age and chuck thank you and others in your family your your, your life every time you pull up somewhere you have no assurance whatsoever and that and, and, and that's just the fireman aspect of it. But has there ever been a time of lawlessness? And somebody says, well, the end has got to be here. No, the end that they ask about and the end that he answers is when the gospel has been preached to all the world. And when that happens, guess what? The end of the age not the end of the earth. That's the way we define end of the world. Think the Lord's ready to come back and burn up the earth? That's the way we define that. It doesn't, have, it doesn't say the word earth. He says the end of the age, the end of the world. And that is going to happen when? When the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. Now then, starting in verse 15, he gets back again to some things that were going to happen. He says, therefore, verse 15, when you see, you who? Who's his audience? When folks in America see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, when you see it, Mark tells us, the totality of his audience, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And Jesus says to Peter, Andrew, James, and John, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place. Wait a minute. What's the holy place? Biblically, what's the holy place? 
part of that temple, one of the main rooms of the temple. When you see an abomination of destruction, when you see there is a desecration, that's what an abomination is, and it's a desecration of desolation, destruction. When you see that coming in the, to that holy place, standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That was something they were going to see. When you see it, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, you may not be in Judea, but those who are in Judea had better head for the hills. You flee into the mountains. And then he says, uh, verse 17, let him who is on the housetop not come down uh, to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to you who are pregnant. You see the word you there? I bet you didn't know Peter, Andrew, James, and John were pregnant. Guess what? It doesn't say, woe to you who are pregnant. There's the you in this all the way through this. But he doesn't say when you are pregnant. He doesn't say when you are in Judea. Why? You may not be in Judea. And for sure, unless the things are being taught right now, men do not get pregnant. When, you, when this happens, when, woe to them who are, who are with child in that, in that day, and to those who are nursing babies in, uh, uh, in those days. Why? You pray that your flight be not in the winter time nor on the Sabbath day. Now then, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, you may be in Judea, and between now and the time when the abomination of desolation will stand in that holy place, you be praying that you do not have to flee in the winter time, nor on the Sabbath day. Why in the winter time? For the same reason you don't go camping in the mountains of the Carolinas in, in January and February. Why? It's not the place to be. If you've got to flee into the mountains to find refuge from that army that God has sent down to destroy that city, Pray that it happens in the summertime. By the way, it happened in August. Their prayers were heard. Pray that your flight be. What about the Sabbath day? Why, why on Saturday? Go back to the closing chapter of Nehemiah, and on the Sabbath day, they locked the gates of the city. Has nothing at all to do with the Sabbath day's journey. You, when, when, when you see that, when, well, to use the language in Luke, when, uh, when you see Jerusalem encompassed about with armies, that's the abomination that makes desolation. That's Luke's way of describing it. It's an army that's coming. And when you see that, you get out of that city. If you're on the housetop, don't go down and pack a suitcase. If you're out in the field, you know, and you're taking off your uh, 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 whatever outer clothing that you had, and you're out there in your work clothes, don't go back down to the end of the row and pick up your, uh, uh, your garments. When you see that army coming, you get out of there as quick as you can. And he says, for then will be the greatest tribulation ever on this earth. You got to understand the force of that. There can only be one of the greatest tribulation there's ever been or ever has been. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes people will read this and they'll talk about, well, there's a double fulfillment. There's a little fulfillment in the, in the first century, but when God comes and is destroying America, that's the greater fulfillment. You hear that all the time. How can there possibly be a double fulfillment of the worst tribulation there's ever been on this earth. You can't have two of those. The worst tribulation there ever has been or ever will be. You cannot pray. You cannot have two of those. Now, 
Which one of those is the one Jesus discusses? He says, Woe to those who are pregnant in those days. Pray that your flight be not in the winter time, nor on the Sabbath day. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, it's going to happen in your lifetime, and you need to be praying that it's not in the winter time, nor on the Sabbath day. For then will be the one time of the worst tribulation there's ever been. That's what Jesus says. That's not an interpretation. Sit down and read the text. Forget what you've heard me say. Sit down and read your Bible and read this. Here's what you'll hear. There's a question about the end of the world and while I don't understand the meaning of that. I thought, I'm th thinking it's talking about the second coming of Jesus. Then, when he comes back and destroys the earth, well, that is what's going to happen. But he says, that is going to happen. This end of the world is going to happen when the gospel is preached in all the world. Did that happen? Yes. Then the Lord, if he told the truth, says, that has already happened. And if it's already happened, if the worst tribulation there has ever been has already happened, there cannot be a tribulation that is the worst one there's ever been about to happen in America. You've got to understand that. Now he gives all of these signs. I want you then to go down to verse 32 of this chapter. Learn a parable of the fig tree, he says. When its branches has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. That's not hard. What's a parable? Earthly story. Heavenly meaning. What is the earthly story? Well, you don't see that that much down here in Florida, but folks up in the, uh, you know, north of us, they fully understand, I believe the trees are budding, you know, and they start looking, I believe it's all, uh, I, I think it's starting to turn green. What does that mean? That's a parable. When you see the trees putting out its branches, whenever you see that fig tree putting out your, its branches, you know that summer is near, near. What does that parable mean? He says, so you, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, so you, when you see many of these things, most of these things, no, when you see all of these things, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, verily I say unto you, this generation will by no means pass away till all of these things take place. What's all of these things? Wars, rumors of the war, rumors of war, the coming of Jesus, not his second coming, but coming in judgment, the coming of Jesus, the end of the the end of the age. Tribulation, the worst tribulation there's ever been. People losing faith. Desolation so much, so great that even the faithful are about to be destroyed. False prophets on the rise. You will see these and you will see all these things. And Jesus, here's you another marker. It's going to happen in this generation. If you did not have televangelists and all the books they've written, you would understand this passage. You'd have to study it. You'd have to get up here and, and, and look at and, and do some real deep studying in some of these things. And, and we don't have time to get into that, but I mentioned before well, verses 29 through 31. I've got extensive notes about the stars falling out of heaven and, and the first century application of that and the, and the understanding of it. And if you want a copy of it, I remember at least two or three of you told me when I made that offer six weeks ago, you wanted copies of it. So tell me again, 
because I want individuals to understand the figurative views about stars falling out of heaven. We don't have time to look at that right now. Now then he says, having said that, all of these things will happen. And how, how certain is that is? Heaven and earth will pass away. But the one thing that will not pass away is my words. What I've said, those very words are being written down by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And these very words about the end of the world, these very words have been written down. And every one of those, all, all, every word, uh, every word that he says, all of my words will not uh, pass away. Having mention of that day and hour knows no man. Nobody knows the time when heaven and earth will pass away. And so he says, the angels do not know. If Michael the archangel stood at your foot of your bed and you said, when's the end of the world coming? I don't have a clue. It's amazing. In Mark's account, Jesus says, while he was God in the flesh, while he is fleshly Jesus, even he did not know. Now, if the angels do not know, and Jesus do, did not know when he was in human form, Tell me, tell me how any individuals can set the date. <laughs> Gary seems, I'm looking at you right now, and I remember what you did to that guy. Gary got a track from somebody that said the world's going to end, what, next year or something like that? Early 1980s. And he found this track from this guy who said the end is going to happen in the 1980s. All right, a, a long publication. You know what Gary did? He wrote the author of it. I love it. And you know, I just think that is fabulous. Here's somebody who says in the 80s, it is about ready to happen. And uh, there was a real stir in 1988. There was a real stir in Y2K. That the computers are going to blow up and that's the end of the world. Everything. All of these things are going to happen. Let me tell you this. Angels in heaven do not know. And I'm sorry, the man who wrote that booklet, uh, I don't know, he never responded, did he? Okay. And so, and so he hasn't responded. And he, and he cannot respond. And so all of these people, like the, the witnesses who have been known for setting the end of the time, but not just the wit witnesses, the major televangelists all believe he's about to come back. I don't know how much you watch religious television. It's all over. Never been a time like this. Jesus, all the signs are right. Where do you get those signs? Matthew 24, uh-uh. Matthew 24 does not discuss the 21st century. But he says, there is a day when heaven and earth will pass away, and that day is uncertain. No one knows when that's going to happen. Look down at, at how he looks at, uh, in the rest of this chapter. He says, as it was in the, uh, verse 37, of the, that day and hour knows no one, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, but as it was in the days of Noah. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. Well, drinking, that's America today. Wait a minute. Marrying and entering into marriage? That doesn't sound a lot like the America that I know today in the view of the lack of respect for marriage. What he's saying is, they didn't know when the flood was going to come. And he's, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, they were living their regular life, and then the flood came. And he says, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so will also be the coming of the Son of Man. Nobody's going to know the date. You start after verse 
verse 34 and 35 of this chapter and the rest of, of this chapter and, and the rest of the book of Matthew describes the uncertainty. Look in verse 42. Therefore watch, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Know this, if the master of the house had known when the thief would come, he would have not, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you be ready, for the Son of Man is coming when all the signs are fulfilled and you know the end is at hand. That's not what it says. It says, for the Son of Man is coming that an hour, at an hour you do not expect it to happen. The, uh, uh, go to chapter 25. Continuation. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be like virgins who were awaiting the return of the bridegroom. Five were wise and five were foolish, and uh, they did not have enough oil. And he teaches that parable. You better be ready. Look verse, verse, verse 13. Watch, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man is coming. You will not know the day or the hour when the Son of Man is coming. Parable of the talents. The parable of the talents, again, talks about the, the man who gave those talents out. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, not knowing when the master was going to come back. Uh, he says, verse 31 of Matthew chapter 25, Now when the Son of Man comes, all the world will be gathered before him, and the final judgment will take place. But nobody, not even the angels, know when that day is an hour is going to be. Now, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 amplifies it and makes it even larger. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when he says, Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourself know perfectly, I wish America did, you perfectly understand the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. I want you to look at that. Not just the day or the hour, the times or the seasons. And what is going to be happening when that time comes? Will it be a time when everybody will know that he's coming back? When they say peace and safety. Do you know how complacent people are going to be about the second coming of Jesus when he does come back? It's not a time when every sign has been fulfilled and we're able to read the signs of the time. It'll be a time when they're saying peace and safety and sudden destruction comes upon them as labor upon a woman with child. Before induced labor, you know what that was like. I'm not sure how that doctor figured it down to the very exact day. He almost never was right. Isn't that amazing? Back during that time, well, it's, go it's going to be the first week of July. It's going to be such and such a day. How does he know? No. He doesn't fully understand as much as he thinks he knows. But he says, the coming of Jesus will be like your wife waking you up in the middle of the night and say, it's here. It's here. I think about an incident that happened when I was a child. I grew up knowing the Bible, knew about the coming of Jesus, and I'm five or six years of age. I'm at that age, might have been seven, don't think I was that old. I'm lying out on the grass looking at the clouds. You ever look at the clouds to see uh, what figures you see in the clouds? 
I looked up in the cloud and I saw the figure of a man. Now, if you stare at something long enough, I don't understand why, it looks like that thing is getting larger. I'm laying out there on the grass and there is this cloud and the only thing I can, that jumps in the mind of this little six-year-old kid is Jesus is coming and the more I look at that cloud, the more reality it is that that cloud is, is getting larger and it's coming. I jumped up, I ran to the house screaming to the top of my voice, Mother, Mother, Jesus is coming. I don't know her reaction. But if you had a biblical understanding, she would say, no. Nope. But what if she didn't? Can you imagine how my mother sobered up, and not, not that she had a drinking problem, can you imagine how much that sobered her up, thinking he's coming back? Let me just tell you this. If you really knew Jesus is coming back to America to judge America tomorrow, how would you, what would you do today? Isn't that amazing? You knew you were going to have a heart attack today. What would you do today if your life was about ready to end? I think it's amazing these televangelists say, the signs are right. Start sending me your money. I've challenged some of these guys who knew when it was going to come to pull out a blank check and sign a check and not put the date on it, make it out to me, after the date, or you can put the date on it after the day you say the Lord is going to come back. Go ahead and put the date on it. You know what they wouldn't do? You know what they wouldn't do. Of that day and hour knows no man. Now then, what's the destiny of America God turns into hell every nation that forgets him. I understand that. I understand the grace and the mercy of God and how tolerant he was with the, with the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But you need to understand that if America falls, that's not the end of the world, end of the earth, second coming of Jesus. What point we're trying to make? People have taken Matthew 23 and 24 and made application throughout all of my life to modern events. ICBMs are mentioned in the book of Revelation back when we had ICBMs, and it was a new thing, you know. Uh, satellite radio, satellite television, now the gospel can finally be preached in all the world. Guys, I'm not making up these illustrations. That's what televangelists have said in my lifetime. And you've looked at the end of every war. It's interesting. The worst world war there's ever been. It's World War I, asked the Jehovah's Witnesses, because he came back right before 1925. Wait a minute, wasn't there a World War II, and wasn't it far more devastating? Yes. Well, what about all of these earthquakes? Oh, go back to the 1915s and 20s and, and 25s. Look at how many earthquakes there were. Yeah, look at how many we know about. Why? Greater communication. Be an earthquake in uh, in Turkey today that kills ten people in one building, and everybody on earth knows about it. Why didn't you know about it 30, 40, 50 years ago? You didn't have communications like you have, and so we think, oh, there's an increase in wars and all the rest. In the in the uh, recorded history of man mankind, I'm going back way back to way back beyond Alexander the Great, the recorded history of wars on this earth. Go back three, nearly 4,000 years. 
There's been less than 150 years in all of those thousands of years when there was not war somewhere. There's always been earthquakes, but the earthquakes in Matthew 24 were mega earthquakes, mega pestilences. Otherwise, you wouldn't even notice them. And so before the Lord destroyed the city, God showed his power. That's it for, for today. Thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed this question and answer session.